Good morning, everyone. It's a delight to be back with you once again. And I do want to express a, a um, happy Mother's Day to everyone here. This is a little unusual one for me and maybe for some others, I'm sure. This is the first Mother's Day without my mother. And so uh, it's a, a day of reflection and gratitude as well as, you know, a little sadness too. Um, but we thank God for their influence and their sacrifice, their tremendous giving as we, you reflect upon that uh, yourself. So thank you uh, for this time to be here. I do want to look at Matthew chapter 18. This is a hard saying of Jesus, a very solemn uh, and challenging word about the, the influence that we have on other people or the potential influence we have on other people. You know, ours really is an age of influence. We are bombarded every day uh, by billboards and bumper stickers and printed media and electronic media, all trying to influence our behavior. Marketers on Madison Avenue have learned a long time ago that if you can get someone famous to promote your product, that your sales will increase. You may remember years and years ago now, a, a famous quarterback for the New York Jets named Joe Namath, who at the time was single and quite a, uh, uh, a player, as they say, actually advertised uh, pantyhose on, on TV. Uh, even though he was a man, it may not be so unusual today, but back then it was. And people said, well, if he can, if, if it can stand up under the, his uh, pressure, then perhaps I, I could use a pair of those too. Uh, Will Chamberlain was a seven-plus-foot uh, basketball player who was seen on an airplane stretching out, and people would say, you know what, if there's enough room for him in that airplane, there may be enough room for me too. And now we have these, uh, this phrase called social influencers. Have you heard this uh, phrase before? Uh, I was reading about this actually in a parking lot uh, before I left uh, my house this morning, where we have social influencers, those individuals, famous or not, who have gained such a, a, a following that if they promote products on their Instagram account, for example, it is a, a guarantee to raise the level of uh, sales. Uh, uh, Instagram has over 1 billion users out of 8 billion people on the planet. And every month, 130 million pairs of eyes go shopping on Instagram. 50% of consumers re rely upon influencers' recommendations. Think about that. So, Jesus Christ spoke about influence. Not so much mass influence, but the potential of our personal influence influence on others, and he warned us of the opportunities and the dangers that are inherent in our influence on other people. And essentially, he said this. This is kind of like my sermon in a sentence. So if you can get this, don't stop listening, but you got the whole sermon if you get this. Every believer must live with constant discipline and vigilance in light of the opportunity and danger of our personal influence. Want me to say it again? Every believer must live with constant discipline and vigilance in light of the opportunity and danger of our personal influence. Let's take a look at the first thing there, the danger of our personal influence. If you go back to the text, especially in verse 6, Jesus' favorite description of all believers of any age is the phrase, these little ones. These little ones. If anyone causes one of these little ones to sin. As the disciples begin this, this uh, 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 text here by asking a question about the greatest person in the kingdom, as those 12 arm wrestled for positions of prominence and asks this question, who is the greatest in the kingdom of God? Jesus calls a little child and places them in their midst. Another gospel account of this says that Jesus placed the child on his lap and held that child in his arms. And why did he do this? 
He did this to provide a concrete example of the kind of faith that inherits, that enters the kingdom of heaven, not necessarily as the greatest, a faith that he commends and a faith that he applauds. So in verse 6 when he says, these little ones, that word that he uses there, or that word that Matthew writes in the text, is the word micron. We all know what a micron is. A micro is this, a microbe, something very tiny. And it's not just children that, 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 that he's referring to, but a description of all believers who with simplicity and purity and humility trust God in the person of Jesus Christ. It doesn't make a difference when you have come to Jesus, whether you were a child in your bed with your mother and father praying beside you, or a university student during spring break, or an adult after a series of reversals and setbacks and disappointments. We all are met here in common Christian experience to have a humble trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior, just like that of a little child. So it doesn't make a difference whether you are a brilliant university professor, a worldly wise business person, a stay-at-home uh, parent, someone who's struggling and out of work. This is the common denominator of all believers. The experience that brings us into the kingdom is this simple childlike trust who sits in the lap of his or her parent. Years ago, the president of Baylor University, on his way home from church, suffered a severe heart attack. He was rushed to the hospital, and a few days later, he had triple coronary bypass surgery. And he said, as I went to the hospital, many things went through my mind, but only one thing stuck. Over and over again were the, the words of a hymn I first learned as a child from my parents, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones, do you know the song? To him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. For Dr. Herbert Reynolds, an officer in the United States Air Force, a PhD in psychology, an administrator of a major university, when he stood on the boundary between this time and eternity, what mattered most to him was the first childlike song he learned about Jesus Christ little ones to him belong. So with that in mind, Jesus then goes on to warn us of the dangers of our own influence. He says in verse 6, if any one of you causes one of these little microns <laughs> uh, to sin, if you offend one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better to be drowned in the depths of the sea. And the word that he uses here to offend is the word from which we get scandalize. Scandalize. In the original language, to, to scandal something <coughs> referred <coughs> excuse me, to a crooked little stick used in an animal trap. And you know, kind of know how they work. When an animal touches the crooked stick, the trap falls and they are ensnared. So the word means to ensnare, to allure, to entice, to put an impediment, a trick in front of some others, causing them to be trapped. And so Jesus says that to anyone who causes my little microns, any one of my believers, who through their behavior, their attitude, their words, their influence, if they cause a micron of mine to stumble and fall, it would be better for them to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Now some of the applications to this are pretty obvious. There are those who for amusement would like to see a pure and chaste Christian fall. Others out of contempt for Christian commitment try to get believers to stumble. But recall that this whole section in Matthew begins when the disciples came to Jesus with this question. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of God? It was their selfish debates about who was better, who was bigger, who was greater, who had more importance that would cause others to balk, to hesitate, to question, to stumble. So Jesus clearly teaches this to them. So to that danger of our personal influence, he talks about the destiny of influence. Did you see it here? Also, in verse 6, look at what it says. It would be better. 
I don't know about you, but this is perhaps one of the most severe words that Jesus ever spoke. It's not the typical image we have of Jesus when we read these kinds of words. So the same Jesus who said, come to me, all who are weary right, and heavy burdened, also said, if you cause one of my little ones to stumble, it would be better for you to be drowned in the depths of the sea. The same Lord who spoke to other individuals who were broken, I forgive you and sin no more, also said this. Now, to tie a millstone around the neck and to be cast into the sea was not a form of punishment that the uh, Hebrews of that day practiced. It was, it was really done by Romans, by Greeks, by Syrians, by Phoenicians. It was a quick and certain execution. One of the early Jewish historians named Josephus said the Romans always used the Sea of Galilee to do this. So Jesus means by this, if the only alternative you face is to cause one of little ones to stumble, it would be better for that to be preempted by having a stone put around your neck and you being flung into the open sea. It was the most terrible and traumatic kind of sudden end to die without ceremony and without burial. And it's all the more surprising when you consider who actually said this, even as he held a child in his arms and demonstrated the kindness and compassion and protection that was always in his heart. So Jesus never spoke a more withering word of warning than this one concerning our personal influence on other humble believers who were trying to follow him. And as he contemplated this, he says this word, woe. Do you see it there? It's actually said twice, woe. It's an emotion that is wrenched out of him as he looks down the ages, not just in that time, but to all ages to this very day, and saw those occasions of stumbling. It was a, a judgment. Woe. He admits the world being as it is, these things will occur, but then he also individualizes it. He says, woe to the one, the one, the individual through whom these scandals come. Now, it's hard sometimes for us to trace uh, uh, individual influence. If I were to go uh, out to, out to the, the sea, I could not say, these waters come from the Hudson, these waters come from the Mississippi, these waters come from the Amazon. It's a distinction that I really can't make. If I uh, hover over a city with, that is made uh, bright by night lights, I can't individualize the contribution of one single light bulb. And if, if I listen to an orchestra, if I am not really a trained musician, I cannot really distinguish the sound of every single individual instrument. But in the words of Jesus, in the final accounting of our life, he is going to be able to stand by the oceans of our own influence and trace up that ocean, every river, every stream, every creek, every pond, my individual influence in the lives of others around me. He's going to be able to take the diffused rays of light of my life and actually trace it right back to me. He's going to be able to see the instrument that I was playing in this orchestra, that I played myself. So my influence will be individualized. How much better to contemplate how my influence can be a positive one for the kingdom of God. Now, in, in 1900, a man named William Ashley Sunday, a professional baseball player for the Chicago White Stockings, was strolling half drunk through the streets of Chicago. He heard singing out of a place called the Pacific Garden Mission. He decided to go in, and he heard the gospel preached, by an unknown preacher. This man, William Sunday, who became Billy Sunday, 
surrendered his life to Christ right there and became one of the most famous urban evangelists. In 1923, at the height of the Roaring Twenties, in the days of flappers and bathtub gin and the Sultan of Swat, Babe Ruth, Billy Sunday held a revival meeting in Charlotte, North Carolina. Hundreds of businessmen had organized this meeting. They were called the Christian Businessmen's Committee. And they had invited an evangelist named Mordecai Ham to be the speaker at their revival services. At that meeting, a lanky, thin, awkward farm boy named William Franklin Graham went with one of his son, as his friends, and sat on the outskirts of the tent. After a few nights, he walked down the aisle and gave his life to Christ. And today, millions of people have known the touch of Billy Graham on their life. You can trace that influence somewhat. Billy Graham, Mordecai Ham, Christian Businessmen's Committee, Billy Sunday, Pacific Garden Mission, unknown preacher. You see what I'm getting at? Jesus is going to be able to trace back our individual impact on others. So this text is more than just a warning. It is an encouragement to say, I want to unleash the positive influence of my life for the sake and the cause and the honor of Jesus Christ. And when you do that, you really have no idea the impact of the lives that you can touch, kind of like a divine domino effect. So thirdly, he then calls for us to discipline our influence. He turns his attention to the individual and inwardly. He zeroes in, not on so much on our influence on others, but our influence upon ourselves. He calls us to look inward. And he knew that the way to influence others was for us to look inward at our own selves. And he issues another very difficult saying in chapter 18, verse 8. Look at what he says here. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, (laughs) cut it off and throw it away. If your eye causes you to sin, in verse 9, gouge it out, throw it away. What's he getting at here? He's calling for an amputation, a severance, a putting a scalpel to something. And you say, well, is this really important? Did Jesus really say this? Well, it's also repeated earlier in in chapter 5 of Matthew's gospel. This is an authentic saying of Jesus, so unforgettable that his hearers actually repeated it several times. So he says to you, look at your hand. It's the organ of dexterity. With it, you handle, you touch, you manipulate the things of life. If your hands cause you to stumble, if it leads you away from me, if it causes you to miss the mark, cut it off. Then he says, look at your foot. That's the organ of mobility. If your foot leads you to walk away from me and my kingdom. Be gone with it. And then he says, look at your eye, the organ of visibility, the organ of perception. If your eye habitually gazes on that which pulls you away from me, be out with it. He never spoke a more staggering word on personal discipline. Now, let me be quick to say, that I don't think Jesus intends for us the literal amputation of our hand or our foot or the gouging out of our eyes. Uh, William Tyndale, a man who's very famous in history, who was the first person to translate the Latin Bible into English, was vigorously opposed. A Roman priest preaching in the chapel at Cambridge University Way back in the 1500s, he was preaching against the common people, like us, having a a Bible in their own language. This is what he said. 
if this happens, if the Bible's translated to English so everybody can have it, when people come to this verse, all over the realm, people might mistakenly pluck out their eyes. The realm will be full of blind men to the great dismay of the nation and the manifest loss of the king's grace. By the reading of Scripture, the whole kingdom will come into confusion. <laughs> so I don't think that Jesus meant the, that, the literal amputation of our hands and feet or the gouging out of our eyes. You see, if I do away with my right hand and my right eye, I still have my left hand and my left eye and my left foot. And Alexander McLaren, a great uh, Scottish pastor, said this, if we take this verse literally, we might as well say, off with our heads. Because our problem is not in our hand or in our foot or in our eye. The difficulty is inside. And so Jesus didn't mean that we are to whittle away at ourselves at successive amputations until nothing is less because blind people can still lust and lame people can still wander away from God. What Jesus meant, I think, is this. If something that you have comes to stand between you and me, that must be removed. What could be more needed than your right hand, a virtual necessity. When Jesus says, when you consider the awesomeness of eternal destiny, if the most precious necessary thing you have, an acquisition, a relationship, an investment, an involvement, opinions, if they steer you away from me, put the knife to it. Now, on the one hand, this ought not to surprise us. We take this as a matter of fact in other areas of life. Here is a person with gangrene in his foot. The physician says, either your foot comes off or you're gone. You may quiver, you may hesitate, you may be afraid, but any sane person will say, take my foot. I want to live. We understand this in agriculture. We understand this in farming. If one cow comes down with mad cow disease, for the sake of the herd, that cow must be destroyed. So Jesus says, if there is a spiritual infection in your life, remember, you're not dealing with the rest of your temporal life. You're dealing with eternity. You're dealing with the direction of your life. And notice the individuality of it. If your hand, if your foot, if your eye. We are not called to amputate other people. <laughs> We're called back to our own life. So as you weigh and as you assess your relationship to Jesus Christ, whatever it may be, you want to put on the block whatever stands between him and you. That's what this is about. <laughs> I could make a list of things here that could possibly need to be severed. And it would be easy for me to say it. Not trying to step on anybody's toes necessarily. Jesus does a good job of that. But it could be a lot of things. It could be as practical as a set of golf clubs. A bowling ball. A boat, a plot by the lake, a hobby. To anything that competes or undermines the lordship of Jesus Christ in your life, he says, put a knife to that with severity and finality. Why? Because this life is actually a preparation for the life to come. Did you see how he mentions that in these texts here? Jesus has a viewpoint that many of us forget or may not even share. 
He is the one who said, what shall it profit you if you gain the whole world and lose your own soul? This was a consistent teaching of Jesus. This life is preparatory for the life beyond. So he would say, it's better to be maimed or crippled or <laughs> so you can stand erect in the kingdom, of, the kingdom to come. It's better to be minus an eye here so that you can see the full glory of God there. <laughs> you may be wondering, what, what if I do this? What if I bring the stump of my life to Jesus Christ? You know what he does? He actually gives it back. You know, it's kind of like the crab that you break a claw off, the, crab, the claw goes back. You might say we're like Christian crustaceans. <laughs> anything, he says, anything that you sever in this life will be compensated for not only in this life, but he says a hundredfold in the life to come. <laughs> Don't ever think then that it's too late. Don't say, my hand is already touched the forbidden thing. Jesus says, bring it back. Thrust it into the fire of his holy presence. Let him sanitize it. Let him cauterize it. Bring the hand back. It'll become his hand to influence other people. Don't say, George, you don't know where I've been. You don't know where my feet have taken me. Uh, they've taken me far away from God. No, 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 bring that back to him too. He will sanitize it. He'll cut away the infection. Bring it to him and then your, his word becomes a lamp to your feet and a light to your path. You say, oh, you don't know what I've seen. You don't know where I've, what I've seen with these eyes. It's been in darkness so long. It's been dim for so long. Jesus says, bring it back to me. I'll do some delicate surgery on it. I'll put an astringent in it. I'll cut away the cataracts for you. I will make your life gleam again. So you'll be able to see the kingdom of God. So... In a sense, this is really not a negative word. It is a positive one. In another place, the Bible says this, if we, through the Spirit, put to death the deeds of the body, we shall live. So I don't think Jesus wants us to consider leaving here, contemplating, gouging out eyes and cutting off our limbs. He wants to, us to bring ourselves to him, Hand, feet, eye, life, and say this, take this, take me, plunge me into the antiseptic of your spirit. Make this hand yours, make this foot yours, make this eye yours. And you say, well, man, this really seems like it costs a lot. Yes. But what did it cost him? He who talked about cutting off a hand had a nail driven through his. He who talked about cutting off a foot had a nail that pierced his feet also. It's a severe word. It's a necessary word. But it really is a word of grace and a word of promise. So here it is, Lord. Here I am, Lord. Take me. Use me. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, whenever we read a text like this, after we kind of get over the shock that you said it, it really causes us to think, what is it? that's between me and you? What is it that blocks your spirit using me for your kingdom's growth? What threatens your lordship in me? By your grace, Jesus, help us to give that over to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.